Greetings to all of you and welcome to session number 33 on the Gospel of John. I'm Timothy Muse, lead pastor here at St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Alliance, Ohio, and it's a joy to be with you today. Thank you for your willingness to invest this time. Uh, time is our greatest commodity. And your willingness to be part of this, your, willing to allow, your willingness to allow this to, to be part of your, of your time is greatly appreciated. I'm glad that you're part of this and I'm glad that you're willing to participate. Uh, if this is your first time with us, welcome to the study. We are in our 33rd session. Uh, so I would certainly encourage you to go back and listen to the previous sessions and the previous work that's out there. Uh, it's all good stuff walking through this uh, walking through this 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 really important book of the Bible. If you're coming uh, back to us again, thank you for being part of this continued journey. It's truly a joy to be able to do this uh, and to be able to be part of the study of the Word of God. I definitely would encourage you to have a Bible open before you while you're studying while we're going through this. It helps us to have the word open so that we can read it, so that we can look at it, so that we can follow along with it and not get caught up in the in the notion of knowing or thinking we know what uh, what we know when we really aren't, you know, so thinking we have all of our ducks in a row or all of our understanding of the word of God when we really don't. I mean, sometimes we get biblical ideas that really aren't biblical ideas. They're more um, uh, societal ideas or cultural ideas or familial ideas that that maybe aren't biblical. So have a Bible open before you. Best best thing to do, have the Bible open before you. I don't care what translation you use. You can use the message. You can use the, the NIV, the Good News, the Living Bible. Uh, there's translations and there's paraphrases. Translations are things that go from the from the ancient language, from the Hebrew and the Greek. The NRSV, which is what I use as a translation. The NIV is a translation. And then you have your paraphrases, the message, the living Bible, the good news Bible that are written. Uh, not, not to say that they don't follow along, but they're written to help make things a little easier to understand and read. You know, for the sake of our study, for the sake of what we're doing together, then um, a paraphrase is just as good as a translation. We're not digging into the particular fourth, fifth definition of any Greek word. Uh, to, to help us understand the gospel of John. There are those who do that. There are scholars that do that. And, and it's good for them. And I don't, I don't take that in any way, shape, or form as a, as a critique. But that's just not the purpose of what we're trying to do. We're trying to walk through the, the book here. We're trying to gain some insight, gain some understanding of it. Uh, and so we don't necessarily need to dig into the depth of, um, of any, particular, you know, any particular word and if we do, then, uh, you know, then I'll do that. But, hey, I mean, we're, we're, we're not in that kind of study. You know, we're really not. You know, this study is meant not only to fill our heads with knowledge, but also our hearts with hope and our lives with direction. We don't always know, you know, what to do or how to do it or what have you. So, uh, you know, when we study the Bible, we look to the Bible to guide us in directions that are important for us. So, so that's where we're at. So that's what we got today. So that's the point of this text. That's the point of this study. So thanks for being here. Thanks for being part of it. Uh, so if you connected with this through one of the social media outlets, through, um, uh, Facebook or Instagram, one of those posts or Twitter, uh, and you know, and, and you're you're connecting to it now through YouTube because that's where it's posted. Follow me, subscribe to my YouTube channel because that's where all this stuff comes out. But also share out these things if if you if you're getting this stuff through the social media stuff through the church's social media stuff. Share it out there. You know, it, it's the best way for us to proclaim the word of God, my friends. I mean, our our mission, our job is not to look inward and and use what we have as a as a power broker, but our our job is to look outward and and share this message with others and this is a great and easy way to do it all you got to do is push share you know push share in, in in your social media or 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 repost it on your instagram account and look you may drive people away of course people may be upset with you for sharing the word of god but you know what that's okay if they are then maybe they need to unfollow you maybe they need to unfriend you uh, and and stop following your account because we can't be deterred in our mission because people don't like it. I mean, Paul never was, and Jesus never was. I mean, clearly Jesus wasn't liked, uh, but he didn't come here to be liked. He came here to be followed. And sometimes the Word of God affects us in powerful ways, but not ways that we want to follow. I mean, way, ways that really um, can drive us into, into deeper and deeper, uh, I don't want to say pain, but struggle, challenge, because that's what the Word of God does. The Word of God digs deep, settles deep, and it pushes us and it's supposed to that's what we want it to do we want it to push us we want it to push us beyond ourselves into something greater we don't come to church we don't come to god just to have god tap us on the head and say well done you're doing great no we come to god and say god help me do better help me to be better 
Help me to walk better in you and in everyone else. So so that's what this is all about. That's why we're here. So if this is helpful to you, then share it out there. Get it out there. You don't have to look at anybody. You don't have to talk to anybody. Just push the button. Just push the share button and away it goes. Get out there. Get it out there so that people can enjoy it, so that people can take advantage of it. All right? So share it out there. We're in the Gospel of John, fourth book of the New Testament. Bible's divided in the Old and New Testament. The Old Testament is a story of creation up until the coming of Jesus Christ. New Testament is a story of the birth of Christ all the way up through the end of the age and the new, uh, the new heaven and new earth, as we see at the end of the book of Revelation. So uh, share it out there. Get out there. Get in the book here. We're in chapter 11 of the Gospel of John. This is the, the story of Lazarus. This is a big story, important story about Jesus' friend Lazarus, and and as we've seen, you know, Jesus' friend Lazarus, he, he he's sick. You know, the disciples find out that he's died, and Jesus waits uh, so that he can go and raise him from the dead. Now, as I said before, I do not believe that God put this sickness on Lazarus in order to uh, make it an opportunity for Jesus to heal him. I don't believe that God had to do that. We're human. And sickness comes, and Jesus looks for opportunities. You know, and Jesus sees an opportunity in his friend. He sees an opportunity to raise his friend up and and bring him back to life. He sees an opportunity to do incredible things for the sake of the kingdom and for the sake of God. Uh, again, and God didn't have to put um, this on Lazarus. God didn't have to, 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 to make Lazarus sick. Lazarus got sick. Jesus heard about it, but Jesus is taking this opportunity to do something great. And that's what he says. He's like, look, this illness isn't going to lead to death. It's going to lead to God being revealed. It's going to lead to God's revelation. And that's where we find ourselves. That's where we find ourselves today. That's where we find ourselves as we engage in this scripture is that it is about um, it, it is about God's glory being revealed through the work of Christ. And, and that happens to be uh, in the midst of, of Lazarus' illness and then ultimately Lazarus' resurrection. So so that's where we pick up today. That's where we start. So we're at verse 28, which is uh, you know kind of in the middle of the story. Uh, Jesus has arrived. He just had a conversation with Martha. Remember, Martha is the more, um, she's the more worky of the sisters. She's the one that does all the work and is making the dinner. She's the one that is putting the time in. Whereas Mary's more the, the learner. She's the one that sits at Jesus' feet. She's the one that um, that anoints his his feet with oil and uh, and and dries them with her hair. That's the that's the um, that's the Mary portion. Um, so so Martha has already heard. Martha's already had the conversation, and so we're going to see what happens. So so <clears throat> excuse me. Wow. So where this comes out. So we ended last time. This is the dialogue with Jesus and her and Mary's. Martha's final statement is, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. So that was verse 27. That's where we dropped off last week. So we're going to pick up with verse 28. When she had said this, that would be Martha, she went and she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and calling for you. When she, Mary, heard this, she got up and quickly went to him. Now, Jesus had not yet come to the village but was still at a place, the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, that'd be Mary, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed Mary because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Okay, so so now we have the interaction with the second sister. So first we had Martha. And Martha came along and was talking with Jesus and, and doing the whole proclamation of faith. But again, we need to remember that Martha is much more pragmatic as a, as a figure. She's much more 
uh, detail oriented and 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 so that's where she comes from. Mary is far more ethereal, far more um, emotional, and and you know I, I think it's I think it's really fascinating because we see kind of the the scope of reality between you know the pragmatic person and the emotional person. We see Martha going about tasks and Mary weeping. So so Martha goes back to Mary. Um, and told her privately, pulled her aside privately and said, hey, the teacher is here and is calling for you. Now, we really don't see Jesus say, go get your sister. Uh, so, uh, so either there's a part of the dialogue that we don't have, or Martha is making some insinuations about Jesus' intentions. Now, it is not that Jesus favors one over the other. We never see that. But we, what we do see is we see Mary being far more connected spiritually. She wants to learn. She wants to grow. She wants to engage in the Savior. She just doesn't want to serve and make things happen. She wants to break out of that kind of intentional male-female role uh, that society has laid upon her. She's the one that sits at Jesus' feet. So Mary, you know, as soon as she finds out, she got up quickly and went to him. There, there was no hesitating. There was no waiting. This, this man, this teacher was a source of comfort for both of them, for both of them. Uh, and that's what they were both looking for. They were looking for comfort. They were looking for a, a chest to pound their fists on. I mean, let's be honest, you know, when we're in the midst of grief, uh, particularly, you know, intense grief, like where Mary and Martha are going through a lot of times, you know, people are just looking for comfort. They're looking for someone to be able to draw them close, hold them tight and say, you know what, this is terrible, but it's going to be okay. This is terrible, but you're going to get through this. You're going to find a way past this. We'll figure this out. This is terrible, but it's not the end. Don't give up yet. All right. So that's what this is about. That's what, um, that's where, where, where Mary, so she goes running out to meet, um, the teacher. Now, notice that uh, that there are others with him. Now, Jesus had not yet come to the village. He was still far out. He was still out in the in the field. He they had not arrived yet. Jesus didn't want to come into the village yet. He wanted to stay out and and let the people come to him. Now, this this is important. Uh, he didn't want to find himself wrapped up in 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 a place where he couldn't get out of or in a circumstance. He, he was really here for Lazarus. Uh, and for the family. So so that's what Jesus does. He doesn't come into the city, stays out. Mary runs out to him, meets him on the road, and falls at his feet. All right. Now, there were Jews that were in the house with Mary. They were... Uh, so so they, there was not only people watching her, but there were also mourners with her. And this was not uncommon. You, you know, we, we don't really have an idea of professional mourners in, in our world. Um, but in the ancient world and in the Jewish world, mourning was very important. Um, and, and being sad and grieving was very important. There would be people who would come and mourn with you. Maybe you didn't know the person. Maybe they didn't know the person, but they knew that there was grief. And so they would come and mourn with the person, grieve with the person. Uh, we, we would in some ways call them professional mourners, people who would mourn on our behalf or mourn with us, uh, in circumstances that needed mourning and focus. So they, they go out with her. They figure and Mary is going from the house to the tomb. This would not have been uncommon. People go to the grave to weep and mourn. They would have figured that, that Mary was now going to the tomb. She was going to weep there. She was going to mourn there. And they were going to go with her because it was their job to weep with her, mourn with her, be part of her pain, part of her loss, part of her struggle. So, so they were going to go and they were going to mourn with her uh, at the tomb, at the at the place where the body had laid, the final resting place. Again, this was not uncommon. It's still not uncommon today. I mean, we go and we mourn at the grave of loved ones. We go and 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 fall down and weep at the grave of those we love. This is part of the human condition. It's part of the human reality that that's what we do. We need places of mourning. And this doesn't make it easier, okay? This doesn't take away the power of pain or the loss of the you know the the grief of loss, but it makes it easier. I shouldn't say easier. Um but it gives a place where we can pour out our energy. It gives a spot of ground where we can shed our tears. 
You know, and that's one of the reasons why we put up grave markers to know where our loved ones are eternally interred so that we have the capability of pouring forth into the ground our tears. We have a place to put our tears uh, because we need that. We need a place to put our tears. Um, and so that's what um, that's where that's what they believe Mary was going to do. She was going to go to the place where she could place her tears. She could weep onto the ground, if you will. So so they follow her. They're like, well, I mean, she's going to weep at, at you know, so we're going to go with her. We're going to go weep with her because that's what we do. We weep together. That's what they're being paid for. Or that's what friends do. If they're friends, that's what friends do. So off they go. But Mary isn't going to the tomb. She's going to meet Jesus. Uh, when she came to Jesus, she saw him, fell down at his, uh, and knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Same words that Martha used. So Mary and Martha both understood the power of Jesus. They understood Jesus as the one who would be able to, um, to, to bring life from death. So they understood that Jesus would have been the one to be able to heal their brother. Um, and, and both of them, both of them have a sense of holding Jesus accountable. Where were you? Why weren't you here? You know, and I, and I think that's a really important question. And I think that Mary and Martha both deserve to ask it. I mean, here's a blind man that, 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 you know, they didn't know Jesus didn't know heals him. You know, Jesus raises a boy from the dead. Why did Jesus not show up to heal their brother, his friend? Why would the Lord and Savior let his friend die when he would be more than happy to help a stranger? That's just not fair. It's not right. Why would you do that? Okay? So so that's the question they both ask. They both say it. Lord, if he'd have been here, my, uh, my brother would not have died. And notice it's a statement, not a question. Lord, if he'd have made it here on time, would my brother have lived? Or, wow, Lord, where were you? We expected you to be here. There, there's no question. There's, there's statement. There's indictment in the words that you failed our brother. You failed us. What good is it to have a friend who's the savior of the world when that savior of the world isn't going to like save anybody? And it's a legitimate question. It's a legitimate statement that they have to ask. It's a legitimate thing that they need to know. If you would have been here, Lord, our brother wouldn't have died. Our brother wouldn't have perished. That's the statement. Well, Jesus sees this, of course, and Jesus is moved by it. That's what it says. You know, when Jesus saw her weeping and the, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. So we see the human side of Jesus coming out. We see Jesus having a humanness that, that offers solace and comfort. He is moved, even though he knows what he's going to do. This is the thing. Even though he knows what he's going to do, he is able to dwell with and be moved by the pain and the loss and the hurt and the love that, that, that these people are showing. Jesus is moved. He's moved by their connection, their love for each other, their willingness to care for each other. He's moved by that. This is something special and important to him. And he sees that. And, and, you know, I guess, I guess if you're looking, if you're the Messiah sent to the world to look out and find God's representatives, this is a moment. You know, remember, you, he says in the Gospel of Matthew, how long do I have to be with this, you know, unfaithful and perverse generation? How long do I have to put up with those who don't believe? Well, this is a point where people do. This is a point where um, where there is belief, and that belief is awesome, and it's beautiful. Uh, and Jesus is experiencing that. He is seeing that for what it is. Um, he's moved. He's moved by the love that Mary and Martha and the friends have for Lazarus. He's moved by it. So, so Jesus, you know, being deeply moved in spirit, what does he say? Um, show me. Where, where he is. Where have you laid him? Take me to his grave. Take me to his tomb. Take me to the place of his final rest. 
Now, again, remember, Jesus is prepared to raise him from the dead. Jesus knows that, that this isn't the end. He's already said that. He said it to the disciples. He's saying it to, to, to he already knows that this isn't going to lead to the end. So Jesus is well aware of what he is going to do. But yet, when he gets there, he weeps. Jesus began to weep. Jesus comes to the tomb of his his friend, his very good friend, and he weeps. Now, this is pretty profoundly significant, my friends. It's profoundly significant in the fact that Jesus weeping means that he allows himself to feel the pain, even though he knows what's going to happen. Which I think, you know, is, is, is relative for all of us because Jesus knows what's going to happen to us. Jesus knows we're all going to be risen from the dead. But Jesus doesn't tell us to just buck it up. He weeps with us. He weeps when we lose. He weeps when we suffer loss. He weeps when we suffer from sin. Jesus weeps with us. And that's a beautiful and profound thing. He weeps with us because he cares about us. He weeps with us because we matter. And even though it's going to be all right, it's not all right right now. And that's okay. That eternal optimism is beautiful, but it's not all right right now. And I need to be able to be okay with that. And Jesus says, yeah, I'm okay with it because I'm going to weep. I'm going to weep for uh, my friend Lazarus. I'm going to weep for him because he died. And Jesus wept. Jesus began to weep. How incredible is that? That Jesus began to weep in the grave of his friend Lazarus. On a little side tangent here for a minute um, about weeping, about publicly weeping. You know, so here's Jesus. He's publicly weeping. He is publicly revealing a vulnerable point about himself. He is not this, you know, pull it up by your bootstraps. Men don't shed tears, blah, blah, blah. And And that's really, unfortunately, in a lot of ways, that's the world that we're raised in. That's the world that we live in. You know, to to the fact that there's there's modern day advertising that says man ha- men have feelings too. You know, here's Jesus publicly weeping. Now for a woman to publicly weep, ah, you know, that's that's not a problem. That's what's expected. But for a man to publicly weep? No, this didn't happen. But Jesus is breaking down a whole boatload of barriers here. And one of them is that he is publicly weeping. He is publicly pouring forth this expression of emotion that is necessary for him to do that. It's necessary for him to show his love and his care. He's showing, you know, that, that, that Lazarus does matter, but he's also publicly weeping. He is showing the, the vulnerability of God. In this, he is showing the vulnerability of what it means to truly care about someone. You know, even in our world today, I mean, we're 2,000 years evolved from the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. We're at a point where we have, you know, we have instant communication, but we're still so terribly uncomfortable if we see a man crying in public, even at a funeral. I mean, I'm a pastor, I've presided over a lot of funerals, and I'm hard pressed to see a lot of guys cry. And if they do, they're trying to like wipe it away immediately that, that this isn't affecting me. I'm going to stand strong and I'm going to be, um, and, 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 you know, there's nothing against standing strong. Don't, don't hear me say that, but, but, but there's that stoic, this doesn't hurt when inside it's just ripping you apart. And why, why are we trained that way? Well, one of the main reasons why we're trained that way is because, you know, public opinion is, uh, is really is really negative on men who show vulnerability. I mean, even to Jesus, you know, even Jesus faces uh, criticism for showing vulnerability. And that's what we get. That's how this little section ends. You know, um, Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, "See how he loved him." So Jesus is moved. So there's that acknowledgement of love. Jesus loves Lazarus and is moved by his death. But what do others say? Others criticize him. See how he loved him. But some of them said, could he who has, who opened the eyes of the blind man not have kept, could he, could not, I'm sorry, could not he, there's the word, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? So, so here's Jesus moved by the death of his friend 
who's being critiqued by those around him because he weeps. You know, and and that's and and honestly, my friends, that's one of the primary reasons why most guys don't show their emotions. They don't want to be criticized. They don't want to put out there that they're hurting and have someone make fun of them. None of us want that. Now, Jesus doesn't care. I I, I think that's I, I think if if there's any one thing that we need to grasp from this, Jesus doesn't care about public opinion. Public opinion doesn't matter to him. Jesus is not driven by public opinion. The church shouldn't be driven by public opinion. We are far too driven by public opinion and um, how people feel, which it shouldn't be. Um, But Jesus is not driven by public opinion. He doesn't care what people are feeling around him. He is expressing what it means to be fully human, the full totality of, of the emotional experience. And if we're honest with ourselves as human, grief and pain and loss and hurt and disappointment are all part of the human experience. They are, if we're honest with ourselves around it. And we should be, because that's the only true way that we're going to go about being fully aware and fully in the place of, of God's grace is by being fully human and, and, and embracing all of this about ourselves. So, so there are some who are like, look how he loved him. Look at how much he loved Lazarus. And others like, hey, couldn't he have done something? He could have done something. That brings in the criticism. Now, Jesus is the son of God, my friends, and Jesus is going to withstand the criticism. He ain't going to care. He, he's not going to care. Public opinion doesn't matter to him. But we as humans can be so driven by public opinion. We can be so driven by what we think people care about us. Or, you know, and, and, and we have these beautiful platforms, but these beautiful platforms require... Um, and they kind of instigate this positive approval of everybody for everything. But Jesus didn't have to fight that. He just went about doing what he was supposed to do. And if it was time to weep, he would weep. If it was time to hurt, he would hurt. And if it was time to raise from the dead, he would raise from the dead. That's just what he did. So so we have this place where, where Jesus shows the vulnerability and he is critiqued for it. He is criticized for it. Again, like I said, which is one of the reasons why I think many men don't show their create their their vulnerability. And women too. I, I don't want to sound stereotypical because I'm not. I'm not meaning it to be stereotypical. Uh, a lot of people don't show their vulnerability because other people want to critique them. Other people want to make fun of them or question them or what have you. And and that's just not fair. That's not right. Okay, verse thirty eight. So uh, then Jesus again, greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave and the stone was laying against it. Very reminiscent of what we know later to be the resurrection story. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he's been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone and Jesus looked toward heaven and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he said, when he had said this, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out. His hands and feet were bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. All right. So we get to the kind of the climax, of the story. What's Jesus going to do here after we come to this? Okay. So Jesus, again, greatly disturbed in spirit, they came to the tomb. Um, and they're at the tomb. It's a cave, stone laid against it. Like I said, very, very reminiscent of uh, of the resurrection. Very reminiscent of of the story to come with Jesus. Uh, you know, we see shades of of what's coming up here and what's possible here, and we hold on to those shades of what's coming up here and what's possible here, and and that's important um, because this is just how it works. So, so we have the shades of what's coming up, um, and and he says, you know, take the stone away. Well, okay, so there's a moment. Notice we don't ever hear um, Mary and Martha say, raise him from the dead. He's dead. He's done. He's gone. That's it. All right. There's no cognitive idea of raising him from the dead, asking him to come back from the dead. He's dead. So now that he's dead, he's dead. That's just how life works, right? Dead is dead. Done is done. That is that. So they, so when Jesus says, take the stone away, Martha's like, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm glad you're here, Jesus. And I'm glad that you're, you know, that you're buying into this and, and, and you're upset. But wait a minute, we can't take the stone away, dude. It stinks. 
he's already decaying. He's already he's already starting to smell. It's getting a little it's getting a little odiferous up in here. We don't want to do that. We don't want to take the stone away because we don't want. I mean, I mean, okay, you know, and and that's really kind of where they're at. It's it's kind of the yeah. I mean, he could have lived if you were here, but but he didn't. He's dead. So we're just gonna leave it alone. But Jesus is like, look. Did I not tell you that you would, if you believed, you would see the glory of God? You know, and, and here is where we really start to see this, this, you know, this, this, this present incarnation of God's true power in Jesus Christ. This is where Jesus really fully rolls his sleeves up and shows what he can do and what he's willing to do. So now they listen. I mean... How could you not? How could you not listen when Jesus says, roll the stone away? And, and after, you know, didn't I tell you that you were going to see the glory of God if you believe? Well, I believe. So what's going to happen? What are we honestly notice that nobody so far has talked about resurrection. Nobody so far has talked about um, Lazarus coming back from the dead. Dead is dead. Dead is gone. That is that. That's where they that's where they rest. That's where they lie. So. So here is, um, here's Jesus telling them to move the stone away. They do. They do. They do as Jesus asks. They follow along as Jesus requests. They don't um, hesitate. They do. They roll the stone away. And Jesus prays. Jesus talks to God. Now, remember, this is what the Pharisees and the scribes and the Jews accused Jesus of when he talked about that, um, you know, when he when he talked when they talked about heresy and blasphemy. He's claiming to be the son of God. He's claiming to have this connection to the divine. So here they are. Here's Jesus. He's talking to God. He's like, Father, I'm, I know that you hear me. You know, I thank you for having heard me. I thank you for I thank you for listening to me. You know, I don't know about you, um, but a lot of my prayers begin that way. Thank you, God, for listening. Thank you, God, for paying attention. You know, we, uh, I mean, we're so vastly small in our own existence compared to what God has to take care of. I mean, we're not as, we're not equal to the stars or to the oceans. You know, God's got so much to take care of. We are vastly small, but yet. God hears our prayers. And if there's no greater faith statement than that, that that we have a God who listens. God may not answer the way we want. God may not do what we want God to do, but God listens. God hears our prayers and God listens. And that's an incredible thing. It's a beautiful thing to know that God listens to what we ask for, to God, that God listens, that God pays attention to our existence. And it is just awesome. It is just incredible. Anyway, so so that's what God does. God listens. God pays attention to us. Uh, and, and just like Jesus, he's, and that's what Jesus says. You know, God, Father, I thank you for listening to me. I know that you listen to me. I, I, I knew that you always hear me. But I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. So, so look at this moment here. This is not Jesus doing the work of God. This is God doing the work of God through Jesus. This is not Jesus being the, the sole power, the proprietor of power. This is Jesus being the conduit of the maker of heaven and earth. So he says this prayer. He intones the name of God, calling God Father, this intimacy, this power flow that, that comes forth. And then he looks at the tomb and he says, Lazarus, come out. Lazarus, come out. He calls the dead man by name and then breathes life back into him. Lazarus, come out. Lazarus, you are no longer dead. Lazarus, return to the land of the living. Lazarus, come back to be with us. Lazarus, come out. That is what Jesus says. Again, this power conduit, this, this, this power of the maker of heaven and earth flowing from heaven down through Jesus into his words and out to Lazarus for Lazarus to return from the dead, for Lazarus to rise from the dead and walk amongst the living. The grave, the tomb could not hold Lazarus because it could not hold the one who spoke to him. And that's Jesus. Again, we're seeing a, 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 a foreshadowing of what is to come in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, and we will see that. But we're also seeing the power and the flow 
that stems from God through Jesus to the world. God is still in control, and speaking through Jesus, God is moving the world in a better and a new direction. That is the point. That is what God is doing through Jesus Christ, and ultimately that that salvation will be given to everyone through the life, death, and resurrection of Christ um, for his time on the cross and then his rising from the dead. So what we're getting here is we're all we're getting not only a foreshadow, but we're getting we're seeing how this thing flows. We're seeing how Jesus works in the world, and that it is. It is it is very much a relationship. Jesus isn't going about doing all of this, particularly this big stuff by himself. He he's he's connecting to the power of God. And through the power of God, these things are happening. And it's beautiful and it's wonderful and it's awesome. You know, we see a lot here in in this portion of the text about what it means to be human, about what it means to be in relationship, about the the human divine God that we have. You know, when we look at Jesus, we certainly always want to lean more towards the divine than the human. We always want to see more of his rising from the dead than we do his fleshiness, his being. But when we encounter the story of Lazarus, we see a human portion of Jesus. We see that 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 weeping, that pain. We see that openness, the vulnerability, um, because Jesus loved Lazarus. I mean, Lazarus was Jesus' friend, and Jesus was bothered by his death, which I think is important. It's a great vision for us because it can show us that, you know, we have this promise of resurrection given to us in in Christ Jesus. We have this promise of future and possibility. We have this assurance that that God will do for us what we cannot do on ourselves, that, that, that we have openness and, and that we will be joined with the saints again. We will be reunited with those who go before us. So we will, we will stand with our brothers and sisters, how awesome that is. And yet we can still weep. We can still hurt. We can still be sad. We can still, lo- we can still miss them while we know that we're going to be with them. So that's what I'm going to leave you for today. That's what I'm going to leave you at now. Uh, as we wade into this, there's more to come. Uh, but I, I don't want to, um, you know, I, I don't want to get, I don't want to get too far into it. So, so I, I let me just wrap it up here though. Cause obviously I didn't. So Jesus says, you know, um, Lazarus come out, dead man come out and Lazarus comes out. I mean, he does, you know, he comes out wrapped in the burial cloth. He comes out wrapped in, um, wrapped in all of the shrouds of death. And Jesus says, unbind him and let him go. Take the, the, the linen off his legs and his feet and his hands. Take the shroud off his face and let him go. Let him leave. He's free. He doesn't need to stay bound in death anymore. Let him go. And that's what they do. They let him go. Um, they unbind him and let him go. They release him uh, back into the world. Uh, this is not somebody who needs to be hidden. It's not like he's back on life support or something. He's fully restored, fully restored to life. All right, my friends, I hope this is beneficial to you. I really do. And if it is, you know, please get it out there. Please share it that others may connect with it. As always, at the end of this, my uh, contact information will come up. If you have any questions or you want to continue on the conversation, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I'll either respond to you directly, or if I can, I will um, include it in next week's lecture and next week's session. God bless you. Thanks for coming out, and I hope you have a beautiful day.